In this talk, I will focus on St. Thomas's life, his teaching career, certain controversies, and his works mostly from 1265 onward, basically the last nine years of his life, which were the most productive, beginning from when he was about 40 years old till his death when he was about the age of 49. I'm basing this history on Jean-Pierre Turel's work, St. Thomas Aquinas, The Person and His Work, as well as on quotations from St. Thomas himself. I'm also using notes by Brother Daniel Rowland for the brief history of Aquinas' childhood. St. Thomas was born around 1225 near Aquino, Rocca Secca, in southern Italy into an aristocratic family. One of his brothers was abducted by agents of the King of Cyprus on an expedition to the Holy Land and ransomed by Pope Gregory IX. A second brother was put to death for switching from Emperor Frederick II's side to that of Pope Innocent IV. One sister became an abbess, and a second died in infancy from a lightning strike while the boy Thomas slept nearby. Aquinas was educated as an oblate by the nearby Benedictines of Monte Cassino from the age of five with his parents most likely hoping that he would one day take up the prestigious role of abbot. He was sent to Naples at the age of 14 to begin studies in philosophy and the liberal arts. He first encountered Aristotle and Averroes there, though they had been forbidden in Paris. Here he also came into contact with the order of preachers, which he joined at age 19 to his family's dismay. His brothers forced him into house arrest, where he remained for a year in the hope that he could be co coerced to change his mind. But he was content to use the time for study, reading both the Bible and Peter Lombard's sentences, committing much of it to memory. Despite these events, he also maintained generally good relations with his family and was eventually released and allowed to rejoin the order. He was sent to Paris in 1245, where he continued his studies, mostly in philosophy, and it is certainly likely that he also took theology courses given by St. Albert the Great. In 1248, Albert and Thomas were sent together to Cologne to the new Studium Generale of the Order. Thomas served as Albert's biblical bachelor and was entrusted with giving courses on the literal interpretations of biblical texts. We have his cursory lectures, as they were called, on Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Isaiah. Thomas's great reverence of the Word of God shines through in these early works, as it does in later works, too. Thomas brings together his rumination on the Word with the importance of silence and avoidance of idle speech. His biographers emphasize his personal adherence to this, reporting that from his youth, he would immediately leave the room if his interlocutors diverted conversation toward anything other than God or that which is ordered to God. In 1252, Albert nominated Thomas to go to Paris as a Bachelor of Theology, where he would begin in the usual fashion by teaching a course on the sentences. Aquinas was also a defender of mendicancy there were hostile relations between the secular clergy and religious, beginning in 1253, with mendicants refusing to participate in a strike, as well as the growing number of professorial chairs that were being taken by the religious versus the secular clergy. This then developed into a theological attack on mendicancy. Monks should be in their monastery and leave preaching and the ministration of the sacraments to the secular clergy supporting themselves through manual labor and not living off alms. But St. Thomas vigorously defends the mendicant orders. He explains that now of all that Christ teaches us, absolutely first is poverty. It is the nakedness on the cross that those who embrace voluntary poverty follow. Now I would like to briefly sketch a portrait of St. Thomas the man as it has been handed down to us by witnesses. St. Thomas had a bald forehead, was large and heavy due to his Norman ancestry. Yet he walked an estimated 9,000 miles as a friar, 
and at least toward the end of his life, he had only one meal a day, awakened during the night for matins, celebrating Mass every day, and then hearing a second Mass, after which he immediately returned to his room to work. In addition, although he had a dispensation from choir, common for teachers of the Dominican order at the time, with the exception of Compline, he was in church to pay, pray in silence before anyone else, although he left as soon as they began to arrive. Yet Aquinas was not without close friends, such as Reginald. He also had a real concern for his students, and he is reported to have always had a happy countenance, sweet and affable. Torell also reports that he possessed rare humility and patience, and that he never hurt anyone through injurious words, even when engaged in disputes. This does not mean, however, that he was not also passionate about the truth. Now I will skip to the year 1265. Tyrell tells us that on or about the 8th of September 1265, the provincial chapter held at Anyani and joined Thomas for the remission of his sins, that was a stock phrase signifying the responsibility imposed on him in virtue of his vow of obedience, which would also serve to, for his growth in charity, to take up residence at Rome and found there a studium, presumably at Santa Sabina. Now, the situation of the friars of the Roman province of the order with regard to studies was apparently problematic, since the Viterbo chapter had warned, since we see that study is neglected in this province, we desire and we strictly order that the priors use the greatest diligence in pursuing this matter. Therefore, St. Thomas was given free reign to, to found a study program and remained in Rome from 1265 to 1268. During the first year of his stay in Rome, Aquinas apparently tried reusing his commentary on the sentences as a teaching tool, but then he gave up on that and began composing the Summa Theologia instead. He had already discovered from teaching the friars at Orvieto that their formation in the practical aspects of moral theology, by means of many Dominican manuals, had left them with a marked imbalance to the detriment of dogmatic theology, says Tyrell. St. Thomas was dissatisfied with this and was determined in Rome to fill in the most conspicuous gaps by giving moral theology the dogmatic basis it had been lacking. But he wished to do this by way of an organic synthesis that would permit them to grasp internal links and coherence. For this reason, Aquinas had in mind a plan for the Summa, which he explains in the prologue to question two of the first part, saying, Since the principal purpose of Sacra Doctrina is to transmit knowledge of God, something he had already shown in question one, and not only to transmit the knowledge of God as he is in himself, but as he is the beginning of things and their end, and especially of the rational creature, therefore, in intending the exposition of this doctrine, we will treat first of God, that is the first part of the Summa, second of the rational creature's movement toward God, the second part, and third of Christ, who as man is the way of our tending toward God, the third part. According to M. V. Leroy, Aquinas sets up the first a, first a grand division between the theologia, or the theology of God's inner life, and the oikonomia, the economy of creatures. Within this economy, we have what is known as the exitus reditus, or the creatures going forth from and coming back to God, referring to God as the principle and creator of all things, that is the exitus, whereas the reditus consists of man's return to God after the fall by way of Christ. This is not an arbitrary scheme, however. As Terrell points out, it is structured by Christian revelation and faith. In the same prologue to question two, St. Thomas explains that the first part of the Summa will also be divided into three parts. First, whatever concerns the divine essence, 
Second, whatever concerns the distinction of persons, that is, of the Trinity. And third, whatever concerns the procession of creatures from him, creation. Consequently, Aquinas begins the first part of the Summa, speaking of theology as a science, the existence of God, the divine attributes, the Trinity, the creation of angels and men, and the nature of man, created in the image of God and ends the first part with a treatise on the divine government of things. This first part of the Summa was completed in Rome and in circulation even before Thomas returned to Paris for his second regency there. The second part of the Summa is divided into two parts, the Prima Secundae and the Secunda Secundae. There is some debate as to whether Thomas wrote the Prima Secundae in Roma, Rome or Paris, but Tyrell believes that Thomas uses his, uh, William of Morbeck's Latin translation of Aristotle's rhetoric more than 100 times in the Prima Secundae and did not receive this translation until toward the end of 1270. So he appears to have written it from about 1270 to 1271, during his second regency in Paris. The Mass of Secunda Secundae would also have been written in Paris, and the Tertia Pars, the third part, may also have been begun there in 1272, and then continued in Naples until St. Thomas ceased writing on the 6th of December, 1273, leaving the third part of the Summa unfinished. In the prologue to the Prima Secundae, the first part of the second part, Aquinas explains, Now that we have treated of the exemplar, that is God, and of those things which came forth from the power of God in accordance with his will, it remains for us to treat of his image, that is man, inasmuch as he too is the principle of his actions, as having free will and control of his actions. St. Thomas begins by reflecting on God as man's beatitude and the ultimate end toward which he strives. Then he spends the rest of the second part studying the means by which man arrives at this ultimate end or turns away from it. Thus, he explains first what is required to have a human act which is voluntary and free and therefore capable of being good or bad. And then he describes the passions of the soul, habits, sin, law, and grace. And then in the second part of the second part, he goes into detail concerning each of the virtues and vices, first analyzing the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, as well as their contrary vices, and then this, the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance as well as other virtues annexed to these and their opposing vices. He concludes with a treatise on the various charisms and states of life, including religious life and the vows. Finally, in the third part of the Summa, Aquinas explains that since Christ is the way of truth by which we attain to eternal life, it is necessary, he says, in order to complete the work of theology, that after considering the last end of human life and the virtues and vices, there should follow the consideration of the Savior of all and of the benefits besto bestowed by him on the human race. Thus, after treating the doctrine of this hypostatic union in the incarnation in depth, he goes on to speak of the things that were done and suffered by the incarnate Lord the sacraments by which he gives us grace. And Aquinas had the intention of completing it all by speaking of the end of our immortal life to which we attain by the resurrection, he says. But unfortunately, he passed away after having treated only of baptism, the Eucharist, and part the confirmation and part of the sac section on the sacrament of penance. The Summa was completed with a supplement by one of St. Thomas's students, who inserted portions of his earlier commentary on the sentences to finish it. Besides completing the first part of the Summa during his three years in Rome, 
Aquinas also engaged in writing various other works, in addition to teaching. According to Terrell, he finished at this time his assembly of the quotations from church fathers on the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John, that called the Catena Aurea, the, the Golden Chain. He had undertaken this project around the end of 1262 at the request of Pope Urban IV, and had been able to offer the Pope the volume of patristic quotations on the Gospel of Matthew before the Pope died in 1264. Aquinas also wrote the disputed questions of the De Potentia on the power, De Anima on the soul, and the De Spiritualibus Creaturis uh, concerning spiritual creatures, that is, the angels. He began also the Compendium Theologia, completing at least the first part on the virtue of faith at this time. He also was consulted three times by the master of the order, John of Vercelli, to which he responded in writing. In addition, he began the first of his commentaries on Aristotle, his commentary on Aristotle's De Anima, which is not to be confused with his own work that I just mentioned. However, St. Thomas was not simply an intellectual. He was also a great and truly holy preacher who, when invited to preach at a Christmas feast held by Cardinal Richard de Anibaldis, had such an effect as to cause the conversion of two of the Cardinal's Jewish guests. On another occasion, Aquinas was invited to preach at St. Peter's in Rome, and, uh, Torrell tells us, after his preaching on Easter Day, a woman suffering from a flow of blood was freed from her illness after touching the holy doctor's cape. Around 1268, Thomas was called back to Paris to take up a second regency, where he would remain until 1272. It is not certain what the motives were for his return, but it appears that there were three main lines of battle in which he was needed. The first was the mendicancy controversy, which was at its height at this time. The second battlefront was against those Terrell calls the conservative minds in the theology faculty who saw in Aristotle only a danger for the Christian faith. And third was an Averroist monosychism. Although many of the members of, fac of the faculty in Paris had read and used Aristotle, there were two key issues in which the more conservative members believed he was dangerous to the faith. The first of these is the idea that Aristotle believed the world was eternal, that is, without in a beginning. Whether or not he really thought that is debatable, but at any rate, the majority of theologians, among them St. Bonaventure, thought that one could readily demonstrate that the world had a beginning. However, Aquinas found Aristotle's philosophical arguments regarding the eternity of the world very plausible, and so he was convinced that one could only hold by faith that the world had a beginning, but that this could not in fact be proved philosophically. That is, apart from the revelation that the world was created, one could have very possibly held that it were eternal. St. Thomas expresses this in his work, De Eternitate Mundi, on the eternity of the world. The second key issue with respect to Aristotle was the unicity of the substantial form. Many Dominicans, as well as Franciscans at the time, thought that there was a plurality of substantial forms in a human being, whereas Aquinas, again following Aristotle, held that there was only one substantial form, the soul, and that this soul contained within it all the powers of man, intellectual, sensitive, and vegetative powers, that is, the powers of nourishment and growth, and was also the form of the body, such that the body did not have its own substantial form. St. Thomas believed that it was important to hold that there is only one substantial form in man in order to maintain the unity of man as one substance rather than a conglomeration or amalgamation of various substances. On the other side of the battle line 
were the radicalist Aristotelians, who held to the verist monosychism against which St. Thomas fought. These radical Aristotelians followed what they claimed to be a verist, a reading of Aristotle, to say that there was a unicity of the intellectual soul for all men. That is, that every human being shared one and the same soul, rather than each having his or her own soul. So we have the ultra-conservatives, who were somewhat afraid of using Aristotle in some points on the one hand, and the radical Aristotelians, who went far beyond what Aristotle had really said on the other, and St. Thomas in the middle. Against the radical Aristotelians, Aquinas writes his De Unitate Intellectus Contra Averroistis on the unity of the intellect against Averroes. However, St. Thomas did not spend all his time in contemporary controversies, but he was much engaged in teaching scripture, his principal occupation. In fact, and it, according to Tyrell, it is to this period that we owe some of his most celebrated works, the scriptural commentaries and the disputed questions, as well as his commentaries on Aristotle's ethics, physics, and metaphysics. A huge amount of work to be doing in a few short years, along with everything else. Besides the lectures on the Gospel of Matthew, Aquinas also wrote a beautiful commentary on the Gospel of John, which contains some of his most mature theological understanding of the Trinity. He published the disputed questions De Malo on evil, which deals with that problem of evil first in general, then in sin and its causes, original sin and its punishment, human free choice, venial sin, pride, and the seven deadly sins, and the work finally ends with an exposition of demonology. Other works of disputed questions published at this time probably include the De Unione Verbi Incarnati on the union of the incarnate word and the De Virtutibus on virtues as well as the Prima Secunde of the Summa and the Secunda Secunde. In addition to the ordinary uni university disputations, the university also held seasonal public quod libital disputes during Lent and during Advent, which developed over two sessions. These quod, quod libital disputes, in these sessions, anyone could pre present and raise any kind of question to be dealt with by the master or his bachelor. According to Tyrell, we have about 260 subjects dealt with during the 12 quadlipital qu sessions held by St. Thomas. During this period, Aquinas also wrote several shorter opus opuscule or um, short uh, booklets, you could say, in response to the different requests he received. These short texts, which ranged from descriptions of the elements to the movement of the heart to the denunciations of magic and astrology. With regard to the influence of the stars, he admits in a letter that the stars may have a corporeal effects in our world, such as in agriculture, medicine, or navigation. But he is very firm that the will of man is not subject to the necessity of the stars, for if free will were to disappear, he would no longer, we would no longer be able to impute merit to good works, nor fault to evil ones. That's in the De Judici's Astrorum on the Judgment of the Stars. I should also add here Aquinas's commentary on the book De Causis, on the causes, as well as several incomplete works, one on angels that I mentioned, De Substantia Separatis, as well as several commentaries on Aristotle, such as on Aristotle's politics, his periermenias, his uh, posteriorum, and super meteore, all unfinished works. In all, Tarell estimates that Aquinas wrote 12.48 pages a day during this period, with the help of secretaries, dictating at the same time on diverse subjects to three or four secretaries. On at least one occasion, 
Thomas sat down to rest a bit, fell asleep, and continued dict dictating to his secretaries while sleeping. About midway through Aquinas's regency in Paris, on the 10th of December of 1270, Stephen Tempier, um, Bishop of Paris, issued a condemnation of 13 propositions held by the radical Aristotelians. Tyrell tells us that the four principal points were condemned were the eternity of the world, the denial of God's universal providence, the unicity of the intellectual soul for all men, that is the monosychism, and determinism. Tempier would reissue this condemnation, adding more propositions to the list in 1277, a few short years after St. Thomas's death in 1274. Because of the trouble caused by the radical Aristotelians in Paris, Pope John XXI directed Tempier on the 18th of January, 1277, to inquire into the persons and places that were propagating these errors prejudicial to the faith and to give him a report on it as soon as possible. Bishop Tempier then brought together a commission of 16 theologians who in less than a month submitted a list of 219 propositions judged to be heterodox, which the bishop proceeded to condemn. Unfortunately, this hastily gathered list of condemned propositions included theological opinions that were perfectly legitimate, among which were some of Thomas's opinions. About two weeks later, on the 18th of March, Robert Kilwardby, the Dominican Archbishop of Canterbury, also condemned a list of propositions inspired by Thomas's work. It was not until 1325, almost 50 years later, and two years after St. Thomas's canonization, that one of Tempier's uh, successors annulled whatever in the condemnation might touch on the Thomist theses. The English Franciscan, John Petcham, whom Thomas had calmly but firmly refuted regarding the possibility of proving that the world was not eternal and regarding the unicity of the substantial form, seems to have been one of those who pushed for the condemnations, leading to the condemnation first of Giles of Rome, a Dominican who shared several of Thomas's positions, which thus indirectly aimed at Thomas himself. Petcham kept insisting until 1285, when Pope Honorius IV brought an end to the litigation by referring the decision to the other masters of the theology faculty, rather than to the bishop, thus suspending the trial. Giles of Rome was rehabilitated, and this began the process of rehabilitating Thomas. It appears that this decision to refer the question to the theology faculty, taking it out of the hands of the bishop, was brought about through the intervention of John of Vercelli, the Dominican Master General, and that part of the strategy he put in place to carry this out was due to St. Albert's arrival in Paris in 1277 to defend Thomas's memory, according to Tyrell. So to continue with our story, but com upon completing his time of regency in Paris, St. Thomas went to teach in Naples from 1272 to 1273. It was during his trip from Paris to Naples that his socius, that is an assistant or secretary, whom the order put at the service of the lecturers and masters of theology, and who accompanied them on trips and, uh, in the priory or helped in the preparation of lessons, that was Reginald of Piperno, fell ill with a high fever. So St. Thomas cured Le Reginald by means of the relics of St. Agnes that he carried with him and declared that he wanted to give his students a feast in honor of St. Agnes each year in commemoration of this cure. However, Aquinas was never able to do this since he died the following year. During his brief period in Naples from 1272 to 1273, Aquinas finished his commentary on Aristotle's Metaphysics and the Posteriorum and began the commentaries De Cello et Mundo, De Generatione et Corruzione, which he left unfinished. 
He also responded to requests from friends for whom he wrote the De Motu Cordis and perhaps the De Mixtione Elementorum, returning also to his Compendium Theologiae, his Compendium of Theology, beginning but not finishing the section on hope. He also preached during this period on the Our Father and possibly on the Decalogue and the Creed, although these may have been earlier in his career. In addition, he lectured on the letters of St. Paul, particularly that letter of, of St. Paul to the Romans. Although much of what we have is known as reportatio, that is class notes taken by one of his students, there is evidence that St. Thomas went back through and made corrections to the first eight chapters of his commentary on Romans. He also began commenting on the Psalms, although he only got through the first 54 psalms before his death. Most importantly, Aquinas continued his work on the third part of the Summa Theologiae, to which I referred earlier. Tyrell lists three characteristic traits of Thomas's way of praying. The first trait is a linking of prayer with study. This is because, as Tyrell notes, Aquinas was animated by an ardent desire that comes from love for divine truth. And Aquinas sees that the first truth, God himself, that is the object of faith, is also the supreme good, the object of all human desires and acts. St. Thomas writes, Spurred by an ardent will to believe, man loves the truth in which he believes, contemplates it in his spirit, and embraces as many reasons as he can find. The second trait of Aquinas' prayer was his devotion to the Eucharist, particularly in the celebration of the sacrament each day at Mass. It was, in fact, during the celebration of the Mass that Thomas had prolonged ecstasies, one on pa once on Passion Sunday, the 26th of March, 1273, and one on the Feast of St. Nicholas, on the 6th of December, 1273. And this had such an effect on Thomas that he left the Summa unfinished. Reginald pressed him as to why he was suddenly abandoning his work. Aquinas responded, I cannot do any more. Everything I have written seems to me as straw in comparison with what I have seen. Terrell explains, that Aquinas did not mean that his work had no value, only that now he had seen face to face the reality which went far beyond words. The third trait of Thomas's prayer was his devotion to the crucifix. He states in his commentary on the articles of the Creed, whoever wishes to lead a perfect life has nothing other to do than scorn what Christ scorned on the cross and to desire what he desired. There is not, in fact, a single example of virtue that the cross does not give us. You seek an example of charity. There is no greater love than to give up his life for his friends, and Christ did it on the cross. Are you looking for an example of patience? The most perfect patience is found on the cross. Are you seeking an example of humility? Look at the crucified one. As Terrell points out, Thomas never stops reminding us that every one of Christ's actions is instruction for us, and this was his rule of life for himself. It was while praying early one morning in the chapel of St. Nicholas that Dominic of Caserta, the sacristan, saw him in levitation and heard a voice coming from the crucifix. You have spoken well of me, Thomas. What should be your reward? To which Thomas responded, Nothing other than thee, Lord. Non nisi te, Domine. Non nisi te. In late January or early February of 1274, after Aquinas had had the mystical experience that caused him to abandon his writing, he and Reginald had to set out for the council that Pope Gregory X had convoked for May 1st in Lyon to seek an understanding with the Greeks. 
Thomas took with him the Contra Erroris Grecorum that he had composed at Urban IV's request. As they were traveling, Thomas, absorbed in thought, did not notice a tree fallen across the road and struck his head against a branch. He was stunned by the blow, but assured those with him that he was only slightly bruised, and continued along the road chatting with Reginald. After traveling for several more days, they reached the castle of Thomas's niece, Francesca, and there he fell ill. Monks from the Cistercian Monastery of Fossanova brought Thomas back with them to the monastery. On the 4th or 5th of March, Thomas confessed to Reginald, received the Viaticum, and made a profession of Eucharistic faith. According to Peter of Monte San Giovanni, he said, I have written and taught much about this very holy body, and about the other sacraments in the faith of Christ, and about the Holy Roman Church, to whose correction I expose and submit everything I have written. He died three days later, the 7th of March, after having received the body of the Lord. Even before Thomas's body had been washed, the sub-prior of the monastery, John of Ferentino, who had suffered from an eye affliction for several months, was miraculously healed when he applied his eyes to Thomas's. It was also discovered upon the translation of Thomas's body to be buried under the main altar of the chapel of St. Stephen, seven months after his death, that his body was in a perfect state of preservation, emitting a sweet odor. St. Thomas was canonized by Pope John the Twenty-Second on the 18th of July, 1323, having by then 300 miracles to his name. Three years later, on the 14th of February, 1325, the Bishop of Paris, Stephen Boré, annulled his predecessor's condemnation to the extent that it affects St. Thomas. St. Thomas began to be called the Venerabilis Doctor already in the Acts of the General Chapters of the Dominicans, starting in 1278. And Ptolemeo of Lucca says in, in 1317 that he was already called the Communis Doctor, the Common Doctor, at the University of Paris. However, it was not until the 15th of April, 1567, that St. Pius V, a Dominican Pope, proclaimed him Doctor of the Church. It is noteworthy that until then there had been only four saints with the title of Doctor, Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, and Gregory the Great. And there were four saints of the Eastern Church proclaimed Doctor together with Thomas, Athanasius, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, and John Chrysostom. It appears significant that between the four doctors of the Western Church and the four doctors of the Eastern Church, there stands St. Thomas, who drew on the writings of both East and West, the common doctor. <laughs>